Hallelujah. How's everybody tonight? Are you blessed and highly flavored? Or are you miserable? If you are, repent. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. How many of y'all know God's on the move? He's a moving and a grooving. Things are happening quickly. It's hard to keep up with he, what he's doing. Because he does so much at one time. But he's revealing much that he's doing to his body in preparation for what's coming. <clears throat> and there's something that he's... You know, when you and I were in the world, uh, we were under the influence of demonic forces. Amen. Not that those demonic forces still don't come against you. Amen. You know, the word says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's understanding. And in this, it says that many are afflicted because they go astray. Because they're misled. So many times we're in the world and we're trying to live in our own strength. And that's one of the things the enemy tries to do. Even after you got filled and baptized in the Holy Ghost, he tries to sway us to begin to exchange the anointing and the strength of Christ for our own strength. And what begins to happen then is because if the enemy knows that he can get you off course, even a slight, he knows the end result of what's going to happen. So one of the things that the Holy Spirit is saying, there's a, there's a, a place and a position where he's, we're allowing him to set the course. It's called setting the course. Now, what is it? Setting the course of your destiny. That's what he wants to do. He wants to set the course of your destiny. And it's going to take a few things for us to r realize what it really takes for him to do these things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, First Corinthians chapter two. Hallelujah. In verse nine. Everybody there, remember what you speak is what you eat, what you eat is what you become. That's why the words come up here. Man, don't let one word fall to the ground when we're praising and worshiping. Amen? It's not the time to pray in the Spirit. It's not the time to pray at all. You missed it. You should have prayed before you got here. Amen? It's the time to worship and praise. Why? Praise brings His presence in power. Amen? Worship brings His Glory, amen, and divine nature. So as divine power comes with praise, as divine nature comes with worship. And we don't want to miss that because there's a constant exchange. The Lord showed me tonight while we were worshiping a person with layers of clothes on them. I mean, they had layers of clothes. He said, the more they kept worshiping, another layer came off. Another layer came off. Another layer came off. When they stopped worshiping, the layer came back on. The layer came back on. See, we're always shedding layers of ourself. The moment you stop, don't get religious. Amen? False humility. Like I said, it's worship and praise is not a time to pray. It's a time to acknowledge time to give him honor and glory. Why? He's trying to draw us in closer. And as we get drawn in closer, we begin to shed more of us, more fears, anger. Everything of the flesh begins to get shed. And of course, the enemy's always, he's picking up everything that you shed and holding it, trying to convince us to put it back on, trying to distract us. And he does it very well. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, what does it say? 
But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Too many people don't even get, the, you know, let me tell you something. Knowing God and knowing about God is two different things. There's a lot of people that know about him and call themselves Christians. But they live a drug-addicted life. They live uh, in fornication. They live in the outer course and outer darkness. See, because knowing about him and knowing him, when you really know him, then he's your Lord. You know, he's not just your Savior. When you really know him, there's a difference. And that's his greatest desire is that you really know him. Why? Because when you know him, you see what he sees. And when you see what he sees, there's a conviction. There's something changing in you. You don't do the things that we, you, want, you wanted to do anymore. In fact, the things that you wanted to do are alone, no longer there. They're removed. In verse 10, it said, but God has revealed them to us through his what? Through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the what? Deep things of God. The deep things of God. It says, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So they're in this relationship, it's in the spirit. You will begin to know the deep things of God. So the more you shed yourself, the more you deny yourself, the more you worship and praise, the more you speak, you sing, you, you worship, the more you dismantles and the more him begins to exalt. And as the spirit comes in, all of a sudden, he brings you into a place in fellowship where there is what we call revelation. And this is where God begins to release nuggets to you. Reality nuggets of the other side. Love nuggets. All kinds of things begin to happen. It's like, whoa, this is snapping crazy. But it's awesome. The deep things of God. Everyone say the deep things of God are revealed by his spirit. Now, verse, verse 12 now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive these things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. For he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. The deep things of God are revealed to those who are in touch with God. I'm going to say that again. The deep things of God are revealed to those who are in touch with God. Amen? And what are you in touch with? His voice. You're in touch with his presence. You're in touch with his promises. You're in touch with his convictions. Come on, write these down. You got to know this. What are you in touch with? His voice. His presence. His promises. His convictions. You want to be in touch with these things. You want to be in touch with his love. His desires. His goodness. His character. His word. his judgments, and his wrath. I'll repeat it. 
What do you want to be in touch with? His voice. His presence. His promises. His convictions. His love. His desires. His goodness. His character. His word. His judgments. And his wrath. Without being in touch, destiny is unstable. Life is temporary. And deception is welcomed. I'll say that again. Without being in touch, destiny is unstable. Life is temporary. Deception is welcomed. Goals become false hopes and disappointments. Faith is minimized. Unbelief, doubt, and rebellion are influential. Unbelief, doubt, and rebellion are influential. And the setting the course of the future is unreachable. Again, more, without being in touch, destiny is unstable. Life is temporary. Deception is welcomed. Goals become false hopes. Faith is minimized. Unbelief, doubt, and rebellion are influential. And setting the course of the future is unreachable. What does it take in setting the course of destiny that aligns with the will of God. In Proverbs 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Happy days. So, you know, the setting of the course of destiny, which God is trying to get us to, and then maintaining it is vital. That's why we got to know whether we're in touch or not in touch. And when we fall out of touch with God in His presence, we begin to see things begin to take his presence. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, doesn't he? We begin to make decisions that are selfish. In Proverbs 28 and verse, or 29 and verse 18, it says something vital. It says, where there's no what? Revelation. See, revelation comes by being in touch. So where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Restraint of what? The flesh. The old man. There is no restraints. But happy is he who keeps the law. Again, where there's no revelation, there's no restraints. Why is there no revelation? Not in touch. So what does it take? For allowing the setting of the course of destiny that aligns with God's will. The first thing is in Colossians 3. Hallelujah. One of the things that there was a requirement. The first thing we need to do is relinquish. Our carnal rights to setting the course for your life. The first thing is to relinquish your carnal 
I want to call human rights almost, your carnal rights to setting the course for your life where you are no longer the leader, but you are the follower. Relinquish your carnal rights to setting the course for your life where you are no longer the leader, but you are now the follower. In Colossians 3 and verse 1, it says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your what? Your mind, your thoughts on the things above, not on the things of the earth. That means your desires. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also appear with him in glory. Therefore put to death your what? Members, come on, read it with me. Which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, or barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is his all and in all. Therefore what? As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also forgive them. You must do the same. Verse 14. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Again, the first thing we want to do is relinquish our carnal rights to setting our own course. Amen. We no longer are to lead our life. We are to follow the leader or the creator of our life. The second thing we need to do is maintain a level of renewing and exchanging. Maintain a level of what? Renewing and exchanging. What are we renewing and exchanging? Your thoughts of worldliness to eternal, to Christ-like, in his words. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. So what is this? We want to maintain a level of renewing and exchanging. This is the second thing we want to be able to do. Renewing and exchanging. That's why the word says forsake not to assemble. It gives an opportunity for renewing. That's why we're to read your word every day. You're to pray. You're to decree. Because you, what are you exchanging? Well, you're renewing what has been imparted in you. And you're exchanging your thoughts of worldliness and carnality for eternal Becoming Christ-like minded. In verse 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your responsibility or reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be what? Conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God in Philippians 3 oh it's good to hear the pages turning on a Tuesday night ha 
Hallelujah. Ah, Setting the course. Philippians 3 and verse 7. Remember, we relinquish your carnal rights, maintain a level of renewing and exchanging. In verse 7, let's speak it together. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for what? Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of the Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. That I may know him. That I may what? Know him. Sometimes you got to lose everything to know him. Because everything becomes an emotional idol. Then we end up actually maintaining and living and serving the things that we've purchased <laughs> instead of the one who blessed us. Amen. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and a fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I do what? I press on. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do what? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching toward those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the decree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, and let us become the same mind. Powerful. The third thing we want to be able to do is avoid those things like drugs, alcohol, and depressants, and mind control medications, and be filled with the Spirit. We don't, not, we don't want to touch these unclean things because they will contaminate you. In Ephesians chapter 5. Avoid drugs, alcohol, and all these other things that, what are they? They're false fulfillments. How many of you all know that doctors believe they're telling you the truth, even though when they're liars? Because they heard it from a college that lies. <laughs> Amen? I mean, you know how many people are messed up? That's where you and I do not go to the phone. We go to the throne. Amen. We seek counsel from above, not from beneath. In verse 14, Ephesians 5, 14. Therefore, he says what? Awake. Awake. You who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. Light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are what? The days are what? They are evil. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and don't be drunk with wine in which dissipation, but be what? Filled with the Spirit. So we need to be what? Filled with the Spirit. Avoid anything that will replace the presence of God. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, and giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Fear, reverence, honor, and respect. Again, avoid anything that would bring a false fulfillment.
The fourth thing. Again, the, <laughs> to be in touch with him, you must not touch and agree with what with his enemies. <laughs> you want to stay in touch with God, then you don't touch and agree with his enemies. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 6. Who are the enemies of God? Those are the ones that are not walking right with God. Amen. Whether they proclaim to be Christians or not, you'll know them by their fruit. If they're not walking right with God, they're not in touch with him. Anyone that's not in touch with him is an enemy of him. Does everybody understand that? Anyone that's not in touch with him is an enemy to him. Doesn't mean he doesn't love them. But can you trust your enemy? You'd be an idiot if you did. Oh, happy days. 2 Corinthians 6, verse uh, 14. So he warns us here. He says, man, don't touch and agree with my enemy. And what does he say? Do not be what? Unevenly yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion is light with darkness? And what accord is Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with what? Idols. For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, I'll walk among them, and I'll be their God, and they will be my people if they do what? See, that word therefore means if you will do something. If you will what? Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And don't touch and agree with what is unclean. And I'll receive you and I'll be a father to you. And you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So again, if we want to stay in touch with him, we don't want to touch and agree with his enemies. Amen. And the fifth thing. Oh, yes. Actually, I'm going to go to 1 Thessalonians first. First Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4. So, we must be careful of our associations. Amen? Now, it doesn't mean it's, you know, somebody's out of order or whatever. You don't have to, you know, you're out of order. Well, you might have to sometimes, you know. <laughs> it all depends on the condition and the circumstances. You know, because the word says, rescue that person from hell. An individual that's out of order is off course. If they're off course, where are they heading? They're certainly not heading to heaven. Amen? In verse 1, let's speak it. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to what? Please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your what? Sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. In other words, you know in your spirit what pleases God and displeases God. You know already what is clean and unclean. Does everybody understand that? Everybody knows it already. From the moment you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you knew it. Every one of us knew it. Whether we were paying attention or not was another question. Verse 6, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned you in 
and testified. For God did not call us to what? Uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects us does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Wow. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy two in verse twenty one. Now the fifth thing we've got to do or we've got to recognize. What do we have to recognize? We have to have discernment. We've got to be begin to recognize these emotional idols that influence us. They, they set us back and bring, they, they set so many people back and bring them into captivity. And they're not able to cut loose because of the emotional decision making. People are making too many decisions out of how they feel instead of what the truth is. And they set back because these emotional idols are from your past. You don't have any from the future. But if so you're living from the future to the present, then you don't have any idols. Does everybody get this? Why? Because you're living in another realm. You're living in another dimension because you're dual, you're dual citizens of multi-dimensions. That's why you and I are blessed every spiritual blessing and seated in heavenly places. If we really are there, I mean, we are there, amen? But what are you taking your position there is another thing. In other words, there's a seat for you and a position for you. Whether you're in there or not is up to you. Because the enemy likes to kick you out of your seat. Steal it if he can. Hallelujah. So we must recognize emotional idols of setback that bring so many back into captivity, not able to cut loose because of emotional decision making. How many of y'all know when you make an emotional decision making, you're sowing in the flesh? And what are you going to reap? Corruption. Second Timothy 2.21, therefore if anyone what? Cleanses himself from the latter. Latter what? Latter emotional idols. He will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. How many of y'all want to be used by God? Amen. It's time people got used by God instead of using God. Verse 22. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a what? Out of a what? Pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach. How many of y'all know you're supposed to teach? Turn to your neighbor and tell them you're a teacher. Turn to the other one tell them you're a teacher. And if you think you can't teach, that's a lie from hell. If you have the Spirit, you're a teacher. Unless you don't have the Spirit. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be able to gent be gentle, able to teach, and patient. That means endure. In what? Humility. Correcting those who are in opposition of God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. How many of y'all know knowing the truth doesn't always set you free? There's a lot of people I know the truth, but they ain't free. Practicing the truth brings freedom. Amen. And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So we must cut loose, must cut loose of all these emotional idols and attachments <clears throat> from our past. 2 Corinthians chapter 
And the sixth thing, vitally important. You must protect your new identity in Christ. You must protect your new identity in Christ and relinquish your old one. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16. Hallelujah. Protect your new identity. Don't let the mirror dictate your identity. Amen. Don't let your past dictate your identity. Don't let your mistakes dictate your identity. You may have the same face, but you got a different smile now. <laughs> it's not devious. <laughs> Praise God. In verse 16, let's speak it together. Is everybody there? Therefore, from now on, we'll regard no one according to the flesh. Okay, that's simple enough. Even though we know Christ... According to the flesh, yet now we know him no, thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are what? Ambassadors. Everyone say, I'm an ambassador. For Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Protect your identity as a new creation in Christ. Where old things have passed away and all things have become new. The seventh thing. You must recognize your responsibility to cooperate and submit to the Lord. Recognize your responsibility to cooperate. Even when it doesn't feel right. You know, people always go by, oh, my gut feeling tells me this. Well, you know what? Your gut feeling has been deceiving you for a while. You need a new gut. And it has to come from above. Amen? The old gut's no good. The new gut comes with a new creation. It's called a new heart. <laughs> they see the old, the old man looks at the gut feeling as guts. The new man looks at it as a changed heart. It's different. I mean, where did they get that anyways? Gut feeling. Sounds like a sickness. Anyways. James chapter 1. <laughs> Tell me, somebody tells me I got a gut feeling I'm running. Hallelujah. Recognize your responsibility to cooperate and submit to the Lord. Whose responsibility is it? Us, personal. Verse 19. Let's speak it. So then, my beloved... Brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. 
but be what? Be what? Be what? Doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. Remember, practice makes perfect, doesn't it? For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's an idiot. Oh, he's like a man observing in his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Listen, he lost his identity. Does everybody understand that? But he who looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If any of you uh, among you thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion for God. And the father is this, to visit orphans, widows, and their trouble. And keep oneself, keep oneself unspotted from the world. Again, you must re recognize your responsibility to cooperate and submit to the Lord. The eighth thing. Eight means new beginning. Seven means complete and perfect. So you want a new beginning? We should want a new beginning every day. And I had a new beginning. Well, what happened? It went sour. Yeah, because it became old. Does everybody get this? We should, everything should be new every day. His mercies are new every morning. If you're in touch, it's new. We've got to understand the unseen battle and influence. That you're no longer of this temporary realm. Why? Because we're this temporary realm where there's nothing but temptation, evil spirits, and you know what? They are fed by their emotional appetites. So guess who feeds them? We do. How many of you know fear is a demon? So when you sense fear, do you feed it? When you react on it? When you react? <gasps> Believe me, when I used to go out and use dope all night, I was fearful. Started off with fear, did stupid. I used to think they were out there, but they were in here. The police are out there. <laughs> no, they're all in here. <laughs> I got every one of them. Had every one of them, anyways. I never seen so many people try to get underneath a couch. Do you ever see that where how many people you can get in a Volkswagen, you know? <laughs> Throw dope in there. <laughs> Understand the unseen battle and influence that you are no longer of this temporary realm where temptation and evil spirits are fed. By, with emotional appetites. Did I say where to go yet? Oh. First Peter 5. <laughs> well, snap. First Peter chapter 5. Aren't you glad we're not religious? <laughs> But we want the truth. We love truth. We should love truth. If you love truth, you love him. Hallelujah. Verse 5. 1 Peter 5, 5. What's it say? Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Be, be what? Sober, which means alert. Be vigilant, which means consistent. 
Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, again, this is explaining the devil. He's got a big mouth. He's a roaring lion. And his mouth doesn't shut up. And all demons have big mouths. That's why sometimes you hear their mouths more than you do to the Lord. But you've got to shut them up yourself. That's why you have authority to use the weapons of God, to bind and loose every mouth and voice of the stranger. You have that authority. The keys have been given to me and you. Too many people don't use it. You know, sometimes when you're crying out to God, he's not going to answer you. Why? He's saying, use what I gave you. Lord, help me. What, what happened? I paid the price, shed my blood, and gave you the, the gifts, the fruits of the Spirit, and I even brought you a sword. Use it. Oh, but Lord, he's saying, get off your blessed assurance and learn for you burn. Use it. So when you call out on him all the time, he's like, man, you know better than that. God is not a babysitter. He's the chief and commander of the military. Jesus is the Lord of Host. This is a military operation, not a soulish operation, and not a religious operation. This is a military operation to rescue as many souls from this earth before it burns up. Because it will. Not today, I hope, anyways. Praise God. Verse 9. It says, resist him, resist who? The devil. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So when you hear that voice say to you, you're the only one. You're not. Why does this always happen to me? It doesn't. It happens to everyone. Some way along the line. Now, if it keeps repeating itself, because there's something called you went astray. Something caused you to get off course where now the enemy's got you and put you into one of those things like the little, uh, what do you call those? Gerbils. They go in that spinning thing. Hamster. That's it, hamster. It's a hamster thing. Just, it, it just spins, spins, spins and doesn't go nowhere. Hallelujah. Some believers have become hamsters. Hamster Christians. That's a whole new one. Resist them steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have come out of it, hello, after you've what? Suffered suffered a while. What's the next thing? How many of y'all love suffering? <laughs> look, what, well, look what it produces. Now look at this suffering doesn't mean you bring your own self-suffering. Self Hello? Some of the suffering is emotional. You know? Suffering is cutting loose from your past. Suffering is being accused of something you didn't do. Because it's an emotional. Most of 100% of suffering is usually emotional. Unless you got hit by a car or a bus or whatever, then that's physical. But, you know, that suffering goes away fast. It's the emotional effect afterwards. You still remember getting hit by that car. Snap, you know. So that's all considered emotional suffering. Or when you ran over the dog or whatever, something like that. Oh, darn, I can't believe I did that. You know, something stupid is emotional suffering. But I can tell you that God's going to turn it to the good, right? Okay, so if he's going to turn it to the good, then there's something that's going to happen. It's going to perfect you. It's going to establish you. It's going to strengthen you. And it's going to settle you. Everybody got it? So how many of y'all love suffering? 
better all raise your hands for you repent. <laughs> and it says to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Yes. Understand the unseen battle. Praise God. That you're no longer of the temporary realm where temptation and evil spirits are fed to emotional appetites. And the ninth thing. Are you ready for number nine? That was number eight. That was number eight. Get the tape. First Peter chapter four. You can go back one more chapter. Hallelujah. It sure got hot in here, didn't it? Whew. First Peter chapter 4. Is everybody there? You should be. Verse 1. The ninth thing. Are you ready? Everyone say, nobody gets away with it. No matter what, nobody gets away with it. Everybody stands before God, no matter what. Amen? That means we got to align ourselves with the character of Christ, stay in touch so we can set our course of our lives of, in destiny. Amen? Does everybody understand? Good. Verse 1, let's speak it. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, do what? Arm yourself. Arm yourself. Also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of our Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these things, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dispensation. Whatever. Speaking evil of you. They will give an account. Everyone say, give it an account. Nobody gets away with it. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh, but live according to the God in the spirit. Praise God. 2 Corinthians 4. Is everybody there? Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. Therefore, that means you have a choice. We do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is what? Perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. It's being what? Renewed. Everyone say renewed. Every day, that means something's new. You're being nude. You wouldn't say I'm being nude every day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, hold on, it says for a moment. See, when there's an emotional attachment to these things, it seems forever. That's where you know where you're emotionally attached. Because when the emotional attachment is cut loose and that auto is cut loose, it's a moment. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Isn't it a light affliction, a moment? Isn't it working for you? The long ones ain't working for you. They're working against you. Amen. While we do not look at the things which are what? Seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are what? Eternal. And Luke 9, we're closing here. 
Did you learn something? Did you get it? Good. You can put it to practice. Luke 9, 23. That's why paper doesn't forget. We can always review. Luke 9, 23. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. Then Jesus said to them all, everyone say all. If anyone desires to come after me, are you here because you want to go after him? Let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily. That means fight. And then you'll be able to follow him. No one follows without a fight. Amen. And whoever desires to save his life will what? Lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he himself is destroyed or lost? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. You know, as believers, we shouldn't taste death. You should be already dead. Amen? We've already tasted this. You know what death was? B.C. That's tasting death. A.D. is not tasting death no more. That's why it's called after death. Actually, I ain't no dynamite. But, uh, but you can look at it as after death tasting. So we're no longer tasting death. Why? Because it was B.C. In fact, we were all afraid of dying B.C. I mean, yeah, B.C. Amen? Before Christ. But you're not afraid of dying now because you're already dead. So the devil can't kill something that's already dead. If you're truly dead to yourself. That is the law of the spirit. Deny yourself. Pick up the cross. Fight and follow. Amen. What is that going to do? It's going to help set the course of your destiny. So these are just little nuggets that you can utilize cooperating with God to maintain course. Amen. Or get on course. So you have discernment to see things through. Every day the enemy is going to attempt. He's going to try and set you up. It says he plans deceptive things against you. You know that there are witches and powers of darkness praying against you every single day. But no weapon, for, no weapon formed against us can prosper. Amen. He who is in us is greater than he is in the world, and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That's where you've got to live from the future because of what he says, not how we feel. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. We thank you for setting the course of our destiny and giving us more added weaponry with wisdom and knowledge and understanding that we may cooperate with you. May the Lord bless each and every one here. Seal his word with the blood. Seal it by the spirit so it grows and bears fruits for his glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Praise God. Put it into prayer.